Good afternoon. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting the start of a new season. And it's been a, obviously since April, it's been a whirlwind. And I think we've established a really neat culture right now that we have. Uh, a bunch of hardworking, high character guys flying around. Really can't wait to get going for training camp and what's ahead, but certainly taking the time to really. Uh, I think one of the most important things for us is to all kind of put our arms around what's ahead of us. And let's make sure we celebrate the things along the way. Second year in a new facility has been fantastic. We have a lot better bearings in, in, in Ward 8 and what we're doing out there. And I think it's fantastic to see the growth of the area out there. The growth of the go-go has been tremendous. We have a basketball community now over at St. E's and it's, it's been fantastic to share this time with the Mystics. I hate to say it, we, we give the court up every day to whoever's got a better record, so they're going to have the court for a while. <laughs> but it's been wonderful. I, I think one of the neat things to do, not just going to the games and seeing our players there and everybody interacting, but coming to practice and literally seeing Mike Tebow and Scotty and, and, and now Ryan Richmond sitting around just chopping it up and watching Elena Del Don out shooting any of our players at the free throw line. It always does the heart good to give them somebody to look up to and inspire to be. But it's been fantastic. Really looking forward to what's ahead. Like I said, we got some really good, exciting young players, and we got to land with some great veterans. And really excited to see what Bradley Beal does this season. He's a tremendous cornerstone to this franchise. We're very blessed to have him. And I'll take questions, whatever you got. How, how have the uh, early goings of the new organizational structure gone for you guys? Oh, it's been fantastic. It's really neat. It's been a seamless integration of new people blending with what we had. Um, I think Sashi, JT3, Danny Medina, I think they all, they, they saw the opportunity of what this could be and, and with Ted's investment and everything and, and for everybody that, that had been there previously and, and welcoming them with open arms, it's been fantastic to, to see the growth and the learning and the exchange of ideas, the diversity of backgrounds that they bring really elevated our, our level of expertise. And I think it's reflecting everything we're doing. I mean, what, what, what we're doing now on the medical side, how we're screening players before the training camp has been tremendous. And what Sasha's been able to bring technology-wise and facility-wise and really kind of management-wise, time-wise, you know, making sure everybody's communicating. Because you've got a lot of people moving different directions and a lot of things going on at once. And reminding everybody, let's keep it, keep communicating between all the teams that are that are housed over there. And, you know, I can't say enough about JT3's presence and what he's been able to bring from a team services side. And, Kind of giving us a little bit of a different outlook as, as we bring in what eight, nine players that are 22 and younger. He can relate a lot better to them than some of our players can. We haven't been around young guys forever. It's funny to watch CJ Miles, who came right to the NBA from high school. He's looking around going, Man, I really am old enough to be seeing these guys. You really can't believe he's got teammates that are 19 years old, you know, 32. So it's fun to be part of those guys, and they've been wonderful additions. Tony, can you describe the value of having the entire group here for the last couple of weeks in shape, playing pickup, the getting to know you part of it before the value of training camp starts next week? Um, it's been fantastic. I, I think all that actually started back in July. We were in, in Vegas at Summer League and, and having John and Bradley and Isaiah. Uh, you know, we had a lot of players come to Vegas to watch our young guys. And I think they kind of put the word out, I'll see you later today weekend. You know, I'll see you in, I'll see you in BC. So these players made their way. They would never eat it to be there. You know, we looked around and the only guy missing was Rui, who had a great excuse for the World Cup. Um, it's been fantastic. Obviously, they're in shape. Obviously, we took a couple hits. Isaiah and having Troy, and, and we're, we're kind of monitoring minutes on a couple of people. But the best side, the best thing about it is those guys will be back soon. You know, CJ Miles, is, he shot today. He was over an hour out on the court and has several jumps that he's doing. He still shoots the blood out of the ball, so that's neat to see. But I think they set the tone in July for what we're doing in September. That came from the top. That came from those players. And uh, when Davies Portanz came in, I think Bradley got a big smile because there's somebody who he can really shoot with every day that, that really understands that. You got CJ, Bradley, and Davies out there shooting. Well, then at the other end, you got a lot of young rookies that come in. They look down at him, of course, see how hard they're working. Guess what? They lace it up too, and they're going. I know yesterday we started, but we, we have physical testing and everything that we did, we got out of the way yesterday. And Isaiah Thomas was sitting out the gate at 7.15. And a rookie came in behind him and he said, why are you late? You know, that's not leadership from us. That's not an edict from above. That's players holding each other accountable. Those are the best teams I've ever been around when it's peer-to-peer. -peer. You know, the best teams are usually when 
players are holding each other accountable. That's a great way to start. I appreciate that about that. That's leadership that's not given. That's just leadership that's earned. He, he did it on his own. Tommy, where, uh, where do you and Bradley stand with the extension that you offered him over the summer? Um, you know, we, we have until October 21st. I think it's up to him whenever he wants to, to make a decision on that. I, I haven't worried about it at all. Since the day we went there, out of respect, it was the very first day we could offer something to him. Knowing that he has two more years under his, under uh, under contract with us is, is valuable information. But I, I, I take my cues by how he's interacting. And like I said, there's probably the easiest thing for me, right? We get all these young players and I bring them in and we start talking. I said, look, the only thing I'm going to ask you, all you have to do is work as hard as Bradley did. All right, it sounds easy. You come in, you see all the work that Bradley puts in every day and the leadership that he exudes every day. He's shown time and time again how committed he is to DC. So I, I take my cue from him on that. There's not anything to announce or to communicate for you other than business as usual. He is poised to have probably as good of, I don't even want to go down that road, but he's ready to play this season. He's a fantastic, fantastic person. If he makes the Hall of Fame, he's still a better person. But uh, where I'm watching the growth in his game, where he's at now, is tremendous. It's funny because we used to talk a lot about basketball and all these things when he was growing up. Now he's got two kids. That's all we talk about, kids. And you realize these guys are growing up in front of your eyes. He came in at 19. Now where he's at, he's evolved as a person. And now he's a father. Uh, just a tremendous individual. And, uh, I, think, I think you'll, you'll see a marked improvement in his handle and play and making decisions and stuff. It, it kind of came because John was out last year. And so Bradley had to elevate his game and he's taking that to another level. So don't want to jinx it or curse him with anything moving forward, but he's poised to have a great year. You mentioned a couple guys that are on a, a limited block with some degree. degree. Is it uh, Rory one of them after his? Um, World Cup ended a little early, and what's his status with the uh, with the in, with the issue with the leg of that? Well, I think when you have to be judicious with with Rui's situation coming back from the World Cup was those first couple games because he ramped down after when he was in uh, Shanghai after three games. It was more a matter of let's be pragmatic. If, if he's even sore a little bit, the idea at the World Cup is try to qualify for the Olympics, try to get as high of a ranking as you can. And we have a great relationship with the Japanese Basketball Federation. They're tremendous partners as we share Rui moving forward. Uh, but I think they realized, we both realized, playing to try to qualify for the Olympics when you've already qualified for the Olympics didn't make a lot of sense. So let, let's go ahead and be wise for the bigger picture that he hadn't really had a day off since uh, in summer league. He jumped right on the plane, went right to training camp with Team Japan. Played in all their friendly games. He played in a whole lot of different gyms and, and bounced around. So after those three games, I think it was fair. And so when he got here, he kind of ramped him up. But he, you know, he played yesterday for, he has played pickup for over an hour and a half. He, he didn't leave the court. So he's, he's in good shape. We're not going to monitor his minutes as much during training camp. I think there's an overall perspective we're bringing from the sports science area to really I'm not even going to use the two dirty words in sports right now, load management, but I think what we're going to try to do is really be intelligent about how we work through the preseason and how we're going to work through the season and really make sure we have a lot of new technology at our disposal. Let's use it and let's make wise decisions. But always the player is a big partner in that. We're not dictating the players. This is what we're doing. we got to show them why and how it's good for them. I think they're active participants in it. I think everybody appreciates it. We're trying to prolong careers. You make a bad decision on a player, and they go out and something you pop a hamstring or you, something happens which, which could have been avoided because a fatigue factor we didn't recognize it. That's on us. We got to be a lot more attentive to those kinds of things. After signing Isaiah Thomas, um, you guys had expressed that you wanted to watch his minutes for the upcoming season. Following this injury, um, moving forward, how does that how does the injury affect and his injury recovery affect how? Um, you may see him moving forward. There's a change in him. You know, it was one of the surreal moments of the summer for me, or not summer, I guess we're in the end of the fall, but Isaiah said, I am so ticked off right now because I was really looking forward to going through training camp. He hasn't been through training camp the last two years. 
I said, honestly, I've been in the league 26 years. They're the only vet I've ever had tell me how much they were looking to train. We we're going to really monitor his minutes all through preseason. It's not a blessing in disguise, not at all. We don't wish an injury on anybody, but I think this allows us to really look at some other players. We know what Isaiah can do, and he's been in the pickup games and everything that we do every day before the injury. We have a really good idea of where he's at, and it's exciting what's ahead for him. But I think this kind of saves a little wear and tear in the preseason. He can do a lot more conditioning where he's at. He's already told me it's as light as he's been since he's been used up. But um, I, I think it's a it's going to work out just fine for him. And our goal is for him is to manage the whole season. And it, it, this kind of dovetails with that. We can manage the whole preseason now because he can't play in preseason. Now. And I, he's already out of a cast. He has a, a splint on his left thumb. And we'll, we'll update that. I don't know what he's saying. Today, but he's in a great place right now. Tom, how, how do you evaluate a coach? What are you looking for, and not just Scott, but, but the coaching staff, in, in terms of what would impress you or, or what you would notice? It? Well, I think in this particular instance, I've known Coach Brooks forever, and I know what he was able to do when he was at Oakland City when he took over. You got to go way back when he replaced PJ Carlissimo as the head coach of the then Sonics, taking a young group and really imprinting upon them a new work ethic. <coughs> And the demands of, of how it's going to be every day. This is what your work day is going to look like. Establish that and then the accountability piece and the follow through. He's done that before. He had a situation where he had three future MVPs. So, so he knows how to take talent and mold and put in that work ethic. And I just sat with him when all this was coming together and said, you know what, we're going to have to reach back in the time machine. We're going to have to pull out that blueprint. Because there, there was a time those guys weren't MVP candidates. There's a time those guys were still learning the NBA way. And what you couldn't replace or what he couldn't input into those players was their heart and their desire. So our job is to find players with that heart, that desire, bring them here, and then allow the system to mold them. So I think any coach, you want to see them develop. And that's what this season starts, begins, middle, end is all about player development. And that's not just the young players. Every player on our roster, we want to see them do better. And Scotty Dope's team, man, we, we integrated some new people to his staff that I think are going to help offense, defense, I think give us a better idea of how to help data manage us to up and get to wins. And he's been fantastic with that. And by options, you know, more options you put in front of a coach, I think in terms of how to play and pace, things that we're going to try to do this year. And he's bought into everything, but that, that gave him a lot more uh, things to think about when we're putting our roster together. And you look at the construction of our roster, we're going to have to really move the ball. We're going to have to get up the floor. But more important, I think, to really make some progress is going to be on the defensive end. So Scotty's allotted a lot more time to the defensive end. And I, I think that's been the biggest uh, hot topic of the summer. Let's get better at that end, and then we can build off the offense. Defense has never missed a shot. Offense, that's going to happen someday. But defensively, I think if we can get better at that end, you'll see marked improvement. And then with that, that'll have some carryover. But I think every coach in the NBA right now is fighting the same things. Of how can we maximize, get this group to, to really play uh, optimal basketball in an ever-changing right, the, the way that the NBA game is being played right now. Everybody's got a different philosophy, but everybody's out there switching. Everybody's gone on the three-point line. There's a lot of things that are happening. So what, what, what we have to do is work with the talent that we have. You know, it's great to have all these three-point shots going up, but if they're not going in, it's a big problem. Right? So, to manage that. I think we added some good three-point shooting to help that end floor. And I think the defensive end, we're, we're kicking it around how we can be really best go out every night. How is uh, John Wall doing? Do you think he'll get the disabled part? You know, that's that's out of our hands. We wait on the leave of that. And it, it, it's not abnormal that we haven't heard back on that. But John's doing fantastic. You know, I think he's, he's in a place right now where it, it reminds me of a kid that can't go out and play. Like he, he's watching all these pickup games, and he's over on the elliptical, or he's running, or he's working out, and you can just see how much this physically pains him to miss playing games. You know, that's what he's great at. He's a five-time All-Star. Uh, it's been fun watching the young guys come in. Heard more than one or two rookies say, man, he's so nice, I used to play him on PlayStation. So I hit John, so he's getting old, just like all of us. <laughs> these kids respect and revere him because of what he's accomplished in his career. Right now, he's not able to do that. And it's hard for him, but in terms of physically, you know, we're very pleased. We watch the progress. I know I'm going to make your ears bleed with this, but we're not waiting on a, a calendar to 9 o'clock when he comes back. Comes back when he's 100%.
but I think where he's at right now, you'll see him a lot more active with our with our players, with our coaches. Scotty's kind of made him an uh, assistant coach in, in effect. Here in practice, he's got some people he's going to be responsible for. I think anybody that's ever sat with John, he's a basketball savant. Right? He knows where all 13 people are on the court at all times, including the refs, obviously. He's, he's got a lot of knowledge, and we're challenging him to, to share that knowledge with our young guys. I think he helps in the locker room. He helps with the coaches. He, he can maybe deliver a message that sometimes it's hard for a player to hear from a coach because he doesn't really have a filter when he talks to players. But uh, physically, I think he's, he's He's doing very fine. Uh, the one piece I think that I'd like to see from John really in the next, during this season, uh, is really when we have to watch the game, learn the game, where it's at now. Because, you know, really the last two seasons he's had a lot of games taken away from him. And the game has literally changed over the last two, two seasons. So his eyes can really help us as we're trying to get better. He can bring a lot more knowledge in. He's still... Uh, Still the quickest guy we have on the team, Rich Smith. It's nice to have Rich on this side. John said that it's it's hard changing the guys from Alpha Rebel. He's been on our team since so John. Tommy, uh, I think you mentioned data a little bit earlier. What is the thinking with hiring um, Dean Oliver to be an assistant coach, something he hasn't done at the NBA level? What do you envision his role on the coaching staff to be? Well, when Scotty and I were discussing needs and where we could get better, taking you know, everybody likes to say, well, we're all about analytics and we're all about this. We are that. And, and I think the, the ability that Dean brings to the table with all of it, you know, the credentials of everything that he brings to the table aside, he gives a different perspective for a coach when you're looking at, okay, we have to master the self scout. We're, we're worried about 29 other teams. How do the Wizards play the best? And those are things that Dean can, he, he can really dive into and bring back some great answers to. And a lot of times you're running an offense that may be efficient with John Walls running the point, but now he's not there, probably don't want to run the same stuff. We've got to think differently and where the best shots can come from. And certainly at the defensive end, sometimes some, a little bit of uh, some strange lineups will, will appear out there because we're, we're kind of testing our assumptions, but there might be a better way to guard certain players in the league than we've done in the past. I think that's stuff that Dean brings to the table. A lot of times, it's all about communication. I think every every organization has an analytics department. Every organization has people that love it. Every organization has people that are reluctant. And, and we've tried to really bring everything to the table. That these are tools at your disposal to help us get better, to help us win games. And Scotty's, he raised his hand, hey, I'd love to get more information. And Dean is somebody, we've all known him for a really long time. And anybody that's in that area, in that space, is very familiar with him. But in terms of being a coach, I've already seen his impressions and what he's been able to do with certain players. Tell him, you know, certain things you might notice intuitively. Well, here's why. And we can take that out a little further and give players a little bit better, uh, you should say, a high level view of, of how to play uh, more efficiently. And he's a brilliant person, so that, that makes it a lot easier. And I think it's, uh, it's just another. Kind of a tool in the tool belt, but I think it gives us a little bit more optionality as we get ready to go play other teams. On another note, um, in your first year on uh, full time on the job as GM, how do you think you're going to measure the success of this team going forward? I think it all comes down to development. Watching the players on our roster every time, being able to measure and watch, and it's not just the, by a stat sheet. It's all the things that you're asked to do on the floor. Are you able to go out there, execute consistently? I would see you improve the things that we're asking you to do. A lot of players, we're asking players to be stars in a role, essentially, right? You got some guys that just never be able to, the only time the ball's coming to you is the end of the shot clock. Right? So we're asking you to set great screens. We're asking you to be a selfless, help side defender. We can evaluate that and see if you're doing those things. And I think those are, those are areas that we're going to evaluate and watch the roster get better. You always know when, uh, as you go through the season, that some players, probably aren't going to get the minutes. So we're going to be very quick to, to utilize the, the Kappa City go-go. We saw the success last year. I think we had as many call-ups, if not the most call-ups, in the G League. And we really maximized with Chase and Randall. And we were able to bring up Jordan McCray and get meaningful minutes. Add Troy Brown, add Thomas Bryant. You know, we, we were, I think, in the first year feeling our way a little bit. Now we kind of learned what we didn't know. 
and we'll be able to get minutes for everybody. For our goal with rookies is about 1,500 minutes. Uh, if you can get those with the Wizards, God bless you. Chances are we're going to have to split time. And so that, that's kind of where we're going. Young players that aren't playing, we're, we're going to go very quickly to let them go get minutes throughout the city. Tommy, I know you've right. been overseas with Rory. You've seen kind of like the impact that he has mm -hmm. off the court. Is there a plan in place dealing with a 19-year-old kid navigating the NBA while also trying to navigate all the demands that comes with him off the court? <clears throat> yeah, there, there's several plans in place, and then, then life happens, right? We're going to go through this season. One thing I was able to observe, spending a lot of time with Rui first in Japan and then over in, in, at the World Cup in Shanghai, is that you know th this is not something brand new to him. He's used to the following. He's used to a lot of big people coming. I remember we brought him in and introduced him to D.C. the night after the draft. He kind of looked out and said, this is it. You know, it, you remember there's an awful lot of people there. But his perspective-wise, he's used to maybe a bigger scale when there's something like going on. So I've really, we take our cues a little bit from him in terms of when maybe he needs a little bit of a break. But I, I found him to be extremely professional. And, and I was telling Bill this, you know, he reminds me a lot of Brad. He's an old soul at a young age. And really is very, very... Very curious. He's somebody that I think is, as he grows and gets to know the league, a lot more of his personality will come out. And I, I think you'll find that he's he's a hard guy to face. You know, he's been to the Final Four. Final Four media, I mean, that, that's the real deal, right? That's a huge audience. You go to the World Cup the next summer, you know, he's going to be one of the featured people at the Tokyo Olympics. Basketball. So he can handle that. You know, and he's showing us. A maturity probably beyond his years. Uh, you know, I, I really got a chance to see how people interact with him and how I was at three friendly games at Typhoon you know, in Tokyo and, and they were sold out. And they definitely weren't there to see the other team. And, you know, there, there were people, there were eight jerseys everywhere. So he's got a following in Japan and it's only going to grow. I think the NBA, the Wizards, we have a responsibility. To, to, to grow basketball around the world. The best way to do that would be really good at what we do on the floor, obviously. But I think he, he feels a responsibility and a platform to go out and bring attention to Japan, to, to Japanese basketball. And I, I, I would salute him for that. We're going to support him the way we can. Just going to the ambassador's house the other night, I think that, that really was a big eye opener. I, I believe you were there. You saw there, there's a Huge following. We never really, we don't see. Uh, we're, we're not always in the, out in the streets and in, in, in all these different places where there's fans, that are, fans of a player from a different country, don't necessarily come to Wizards games. Now I think we're going to see that. We'll see a great following, not just here but on the road. And I think that's the one thing we're trying to get him ready for, is that tour, as we go to 29 NBA arenas and get used to that. Every time you go, it's going to be a big pull on you. And it's going to feel like Groundhog Day. Yeah, but I think he's got this good. Tom, okay. <clears throat> when uh, Telly Ossie first made uh, the organizational shifts back in April, one of the things he mentioned was uh, changing the culture. Mm -hmm. Since you've taken over as the GM, how do you think that you've been as, as far as imprinting yourself on molding the new culture? I don't know that it's imprinting myself. I think it's all of us collectively deciding where were the gaps, what could we do better? I think one thing I love to bring to, to, to our group is energy. And the, 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 the push for me is let's strengthen, let's revitalize, let's, let's really get people here that uh, we're proud of, that, that we feel we can grow. And it's not just with the, with the players, right? It's the staff. It's all the support staff around. So I think we're, we're always our harshest critics, but I think for us, we're pretty big cheerleaders of each other. And I think everybody wants to see this work and, and everybody's put in the time. And I think the relationships are authentic and, and it's been tremendous the growth just since April so if you can kind of use your your, your eyes for the future and see the potential of what this could become and, and we're really excited about that we're grateful for the investment from ownership to do all these things but uh, the impression I think we've all made on each other is that hey this is a great opportunity to show what you can do or how you can impact it be star in your role. If you're player development, there's great opportunities to develop players. If you're in our analytic and strategy area, these are areas that they all intersect. So analytic 
strategic area and can walk over any coach or some things we're looking at. We really upgraded our video area as well. I think video is the very best teacher for our players. They can grasp very quickly. So we're trying to figure out how to, to do that. And by trying to get guys off their cell phone, but we keep sending them clips on the phone. <laughs> so don't look at your phone except when we send you stuff. <laughs> How, how did you upgrade the, the video? Was, was there other technology and those sorts of things that, that you guys changed as well? I, I don't know if change as much as upgrade. Um, we, we put a lot more ideas in use, and there's a lot more using Second Spectrum and some of the other technology pieces, just optimizing things that may not have existed, maybe making them better. And uh, you know, when you bring a lot of different ideas in, like we did with a lot of new people, they bring you a lot of good ideas that, that we onboard as well. One area, going back to what you asked me earlier, I think we, we added pro personnel right? that didn't really exist. We, we thought we were pro personnel because we're at NBA games every night. That's not the truth. You've got to have a very structured pursuit of how you're going to go at trade deadline, how you're going to go at free agency. And pro personnel, also in, in, you're including the G League in that, you're including international. And we, we really scaled up there. And it allowed me, selfishly, to bring some people home. And, you know, Antoine Jameson and Ron Prop are very fond of them, and they get a chance to do some more stuff. And Jeffrey Wood's going to do more stuff with us on the college side. And then adding the people that we did add though, across the board, I think it's going to make it so much more valuable. I think our decision making will have a lot more information before we make the decision. And the repetitions that you get going to NBA, G League games, with more people seeing the same things, getting more opinions, I think it only helps. Tommy. Looking at the, um, looking at looking at sort of the big picture of the league, it seems like uh, maybe this is the first time in, in quite a while that more than one or two teams head into next season with a legitimate title chance. I'm just wondering, from your perspective, first of all, do you agree with that premise, and how do you think that changes things heading into this season? You know, I talked to at least seven GMs um, over the summer that really feel they're they, they, they're going to go for it. Now, I think that gets whittled down. It'll be three or four teams, and that, that kind of reflects every year, right? There's truly teams that are capable of winning a title, teams that have title aspirations. But I do think, I agree with you, there's not that one team that everybody says that's the team to beat. Really. And, and last summer, if we all remember, it was supposed to be Golden State, and that didn't end up that way. So I think people are a little bit more cautious now. And a lot more, I think, you know, 200 players changed teams this summer. So a lot of the teams, Jerseys are the same on the front, but the name on the back is different. It changes how you uh, uh, chemistry. So I think a lot of teams that are really excited and going forward, they have to be able to factor in what happens during the season. You know, the, the names look great on, on paper, but the game's played on wood, and it's always been that way. More teams are going for it, for sure. With uh, a lot of teams wanting to take the youngest players in the draft, one-and-done players, you took four guys, Rui, Admiral, um, Garrison and Justin, who spent three, four years in college. Is there something that attracted you to players who might be more seasoned? Yeah, you know, and that's not a swipe at one and done people at all. I just think when you were where we were at, and we were pretty, pretty heavy, we were taking Rui regardless, right? But I think where we were at, and you evaluate players that can make an impact <clears throat> quickly. A player that played for Mark Few, a player that played for Rick Barnes. Played play for Buzz Williams, Coach Alexander, which now Belmont was with Lipscomb. They were very good coaches. And those players had three, four year resumes of winning. That was attractive to us. It didn't mean we wouldn't take it. If we like somebody that was one and done, we'd do that in a heartbeat. But we felt this would help us energize quicker, kind of make the coach's job a lot easier, a lot less time on the on the upkeep, on the uptake for these guys. And I think we saw that a little bit in summer league. These players were able to get out on the floor and do some things that, that NBA players do versus that transitioning player. And we'll continue to look for high basketball IQ, high character, hard working players. That's kind of our, right now, you know, it's an easy thing to say, but we're really trying to really pin it down to what exactly we, we're going to measure that will put that out there. That this is the player that's a wizard player. You know, the characteristics we're looking for. And I think that's something that we'll always have on the scale is who did you play for? How old is your record? What did you do? And a lot of players go through college, put up big numbers, did they win? And winning is still important. Did they have an impact on winning? And that's really what we measure is winning plays during your, your career. And 
we're really pushing our data towards that to help us identify those kinds of players. And, and I know that Garrison Matthews would have jumped off on a lot of people, except people that watched him through his career. Uh, he, he can also shoot the floor out of the ball. He's a good, good player to develop. Justin Robinson, the many times I saw him at home on the road, the time I saw him lose was in this building last year. I remind him of that all the time. The Duke game. But Justin wins. He's a winner. And watching Admiral and his progress, we didn't have to ask too many people about Admiral because we had Dickie Simpkins on staff who works for us, the coach here in the AAU team growing up. So we had really good character references to him. What we've been able to do at Gonzaga, I think, speaks highly to his ability to adapt to the U.S. basketball game. And then bringing his international game here has been, it's been a good blend for him. But those characteristics are going to continue to, we're going to keep kind of fine tuning. And there's going to be more that's going to come as we start to look. The NBA is about to get younger in a few years, possibly, right? So we got to really figure out how we can best be ready, prepared for that. And that's why we're really ramped up on player development, really ramped up video, and all the other things in team services in anticipation that the league will get younger in the future. The last couple of years, you guys have uh, not utilized the whole team roster spot. Sometimes when they have 13 guys, based on what you have, mm -hmm. what's your anticipation of? Well, as a business matter right now, we have players that are injured, right? And so the two-way contract is very helpful in those situations, being able to plug a hole. If you have 15 players and one gets hurt, that's the only way you can plug it. If you have 14 players, you can sign somebody and bring them in. That's not in the G League. It's not, you know, there's all kinds. It gives you optionality. And I, I really like the, the motivation of inviting players to camp like a Justin Anderson knowing that there's a genuine roster spot open, that's a sincere invitation. It's not, hey, come to camp and, and maybe we'll trade two people or cut someone so we can keep you. That's not sincere. You know, and, and I don't have to look any further than Ish Smith. Like, years ago, Ish came to camp with us knowing we had 15 guaranteed. And it broke our heart. We, we wanted to keep him in the worst way, but the money prevented it. That left a scar, right? So most of the things I know how to do are on the backs of things that we probably screwed up. Right? There's something that you learn from everything. You learn how to do things, you learn how not to do things. My vision of putting rosters together, it doesn't make a lot of sense not to hold back a roster spot for the competition, for the inevitable injury, something that gives you a lot, a lot more optionality. And uh, you know, it's kind of neat when we brought Ish back, you know, because at that time we cut him as a make good minimum. So I said, we, we made it up to you, okay? <laughs> Forgive us. <laughs> He's doing all right, it's not a minimum. Tommy, with a handful of rotational players, you mentioned injured. How do you foresee an impact from training camp unless you're able to, or maybe not able to do? I think that the neatest thing is the players themselves will say, hey, next man up. It gives somebody else an opportunity to shine. I think we have some interesting players that we acquired from the Lakers this summer that kind of joined us midstream summer league. And, and that's basically organized pickup. At that point, you bring somebody in and you give them a couple plays, they go out and play. You don't have a great idea what they're like. So now you have with Mo Wagner, with Isaac Bongo, with Jamario Jones, you've got some opportunities to let those guys loose a little bit more in camp, get more reps at their positions. Gives Justin Robinson an opportunity to step up a little bit in the in the depth chart. And certainly we brought back Chris Gioza, who was an exhibit ten force last year that signed with Houston, was called up and played seven games in the NBA last year. So that gives him a little credibility too. But it, it just, you know, you make the best out of a bad situation. Certainly we'd rather be healthy. But I think the way the players look at it is that it gives them more chance to do some things. And, and knowing that we'll get those players back, I think is very calming on coaches. Their injuries, injuries stink, they do. But these guys will come back. And I think we'll be better for it. Gives a little bit more. Toronto proved last year, you know, winning the NBA long term at a high level, you better have depth. So it helps us, we're just trying to build depth up. And it gives us great opportunities. Don't try it at home, but. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you.